There was a lot of backlash when the Demon's Souls 2020 remake released because of a pre-order exclusive weapon that could not be obtained by any other means. The anger soon died down though, as it quickly became apparent that the weapon was just awful, with terrible scaling that becomes redundant at higher levels. Some even labelled it a scam, and even the worst weapon in the entire game. Ho oh, oh, ho, you know what that means. Welcome to RPG Challenge Runs, and today we ask ourselves, can you beat Demon Souls Remake with only the pre-order exclusive Reaper Scythe? Of course, that means absolutely no armour, no accessories, no damage dealing items, no summons, no glitches, hacks, mods, cheats, etc. Let's do it. We name ourselves Grim Reaper, and have to start by deciding our class. Stats are the name of the game here, since the Reaper Scythe requires 13 strength and 13 dexterity to wield, though our strength value will be multiplied by 1.5 to meet the requirement if we two hand the weapon. That means only the Wanderer and Thief classes have the ability to properly wield the Scythe from the get go. We go with Wanderer for the slightly higher endurance and choose the Elixir starting gift as pretty much all the others are pieces of equipment or damage dealing items, both of which are banned by the rules. A reminder that items that do not damage enemies such as soul remains and grasses are fair game. Our Joker X Venom love child begins his adventure by unequipping everything and sprinting through the tutorial area, dodging every enemy because we don't gain access to the scythe until we reach Stockpile Thomas. Thankfully, it only takes one big thwallop from this chunky monkey, and we're transported to our new home, the Nexus, which acts as a sort of kinda warp room style hub area in this game. And here it is everybody, the weapon that's hopefully going to be carrying us to victory. It's classed as a pole weapon with E scaling in strength and D in dexterity, meaning those two stats will have a tiny effect on increasing its damage, but not by much. It can also inflict bleed, which is just extra damage over time if we attack the same enemy enough times to build it up. We grab the items that are lying around the Nexus, but we can't yet continue onto the Monumental until we clear stage 1-1 and its boss Phalanx, so <laughs> here we go. Time to try out this Reaper Scythe. Initial impressions are that it's kinda slow and clunky, and blocking with it really doesn't help mitigate damage very well. For some reason, the heavy attack actually does less damage than the light attack, just with a slightly wider arc, so I doubt we'll be using that very often. What is awesome though, is this backstab animation. Ho oh, ho, ouch, gory. We soon discover that parrying with this thing is not possible, so we just try sprinting through the area in the hope of unlocking one of the shortcuts. It's worth mentioning that I've never used this weapon before this playthrough that you're seeing here, and I don't pretend to be a Soulsborne expert, so please take it easy on me in the comments section. After a few deaths, we do manage to get the very first shortcut door open, and then decide to test ourselves by 1v1ing this blue-eyed knight. The early backstab deals massive damage, but we have to keep alert because it's very likely that this guy could one-shot us. We try to bait out an attack, but he's having none of it, opting to go for the self-heal instead, so we rush in and stunlock him for the win. Ha! That's two half-moon grasses in the bag. Prince Ostrava wants help wiping out these dreglings, but as you've probably noticed by now, we're not very good against groups of enemies, and I, uh, accidentally walked into a fire. Haha, <laughs> whoops. We're not allowed to level up until the first boss is dead, meaning we're free to spend all of our souls on restorative items or anything else that'll make this level slightly less painful. Secret traps like this one can be used to your advantage, haha, <laughs> very nice. While at the first dragon bridge, we just bait individual enemies back while the dragon warms himself up, so we're not getting shot by the archers. And after that, well, haha, <laughs> run! <laughs> okay, whew. Right, the boss door is now open. Here's our setup going into the Phalanx boss fight. We don't have a lot of healing items, so we'll probably get rinsed first time around, but just think of it as a practice round. Fingers crossed everyone, let's do this. Phalanx itself is just a big blob of nothing, but it surrounds itself with 35 hoplite enemies which do regenerate health and even respawn if enough time passes. This means we need to play offensively while also looking after our own HP, which is a delicate balancing act, but luckily the pillars scattered throughout the room offer decent protection. For those unaware, Phalanx is weak to fire, but we're not using any sort of pine resins or fire bombs, as those deal additional damage and are therefore banned by the rules. 
The scythe cannot be upgraded in any way and we can't level up until after this boss is dead, so we really are as strong as we can ever possibly be. Elixirs help to keep our stamina regeneration rate up, but we still have to be very cautious. Nine minutes into the fight and we spot that Phalanx's backside is vulnerable, so we flank around and seal the deal. Job done. With Phalanx defeated, we can grab more items from the upper echelons of the Nexus, accept this guy's quest of bringing peace back to Boletaria, <laughs> stupid kid, level up 15 times, repair our gear and get resupplied. But where to go next? Hmm. We decide to shift over and have a crack at World 4. The skeletons here are strong but manageable, we just have to be careful not to let them stagger us or it's game over. We try just running past them, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> we eventually make it to the ramparts where we're forced to choose between the claustrophobic sewers full of skeletons or the big chunky vanguard demon. We also find this weird rendering glitch. <laughs> We've knocked the archers down from the ramparts, but they just keep vanishing. <laughs> weird. Okay, yeah, gameplay, right. We bait out the vanguard demon to skim past, <laughs> excuse me, rescue merchant Blige, I'm Blige, fill at the shortcut a few dozen times before finally getting good, and head on into the adjudicator boss fight. Sorry for not showing the equipment screen before coming in here, but there was a red eye skeleton ninja on the stairs and I really didn't want to get backstabbed. <laughs> You can tell I'm not cheating with any rings etc though, because there's no additional icons at the top left of the screen. Anyway, what's this guy's deal? Well, we're in an incredibly tiny arena against a guy who doesn't take any damage. The strategy, for melee builds at least, is to smash the big iron wedge thing that's sticking out of his flab until the golden bird comes crashing down, allowing us to actually deal some damage. Rinse and repeat. This boss gets a lot of hate, but I think it's really unique and has great lore speculations behind it. Nevertheless, we took it down in well under 4 minutes without taking a single point of damage. That's 2 bosses down and 15 to go. After levelling up a bit, we farm some souls at the infamous Ritual Path farming location, which we'll be using a lot in this run. For those unaware, killing this fellow Reaper also insta-kills all of his minions, meaning you can gain thousands of souls in just a single minute. Rinse and repeat. It's much faster with a bow, but here we don't have that luxury, so we just have to get our hands dirty. We have a quick run in with patches, and farm a tiny bit more before hopping back over to World 1. There's a massive dragon shooting fire onto the ramparts here, but we take the alternate underground path in the mid section to give ourselves some breathing room. Enemies love to ambush you down here, including a pack of super aggressive wolves, but knowledge is power as they say, and this part of the game is actually very straightforward once you get to know the enemy placements, attack angles and dragon timings. We actually made it to the next boss door on the first attempt, haha <laughs> nice! Ah the infamous tower knight, god this guy looks amazing in the remake. To be honest, the entire game looks gorgeous. Oh, I don't know about you guys, but when I first saw that this game was getting a remake, I went wild! It was already one of my favourite games of all time, and possibly my favourite ever PS3 game, so seeing that trailer drop back in June 2020, oh wow, what a time to be alive. Anyway, we've killed the annoying archers here, and it's time to take down the big boy himself. Just like many future Soulsborne bosses, this guy wins the award for being the original hit the heels until it falls over boss. After he topples, we can smack the head for massive damage! Rinse and repeat. Most bosses in this game are kinda like puzzles in a way, so once you get to know how to tackle them, you're already halfway there. A respectable time of 5 minutes. Not bad. The problem? Well, this wall of dense fog leading to the remainder of World 1 won't open up until we fully complete another world. That means killing all three bosses in either World 2, 3, 4 or 5. The Stonefang Tunnel of World 2 is probably our best bet. We start by destroying this crystal gecko for absolutely no reason because we can't even upgrade the scythe anyway. Then we explore every nook and cranny to mop up the myriad items scattered throughout this place. I'm a big fan of levels that are mostly linear but have some secret side paths that really reward you for being adventurous, but I think that's just the RPG fanatic in me. 
Uh, there are a lot of enemies here, but backstabs are one-shotting the trash mobs. So we activate the shortcut lift, try not to burn to death, deal with some cracking good AI. <laughs> what are they even doing? Uh, cool some lava and head on into the next boss door. Again, here's our setup going in. Not a lot of healing items, but we should be alright. Okay, time for the armor spider. Wow, <laughs> a British spelling in a video game. You don't see that much anymore. Uh, yeah, so we're in a long tunnel and obviously have to close the distance while it shoots fireballs and snaring webs at us. But even up close, this guy has some strong and rapid physical attacks. We're not dealing a lot of damage and its body slams are pretty much unavoidable due to the scythe's extremely long animation locks. We make sure that we always run fully back whenever it starts shaking and subsequently filling the place with flammable oil and only push in for attacks when it's safe or when we can afford to tank the damage. It's dead in under five minutes. Now, where the hell is that maiden? I swear she hides from you in this game. <laughs> First to find her gets a cookie, because I obviously hadn't seen her. Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah, I've clicked. But just one level? Oof, ouch. Time for everyone's second favourite hellhole, World 3, the Tower of Latria. An absolute maze of a prison filled with these Lovecraftian horrors that can stunlock you, grab you, shoot you, do AoE blasts. Oh, just overall, not very nice individuals. It pays to get the jump on them and kill them before they kill you. They bring out this contraption, which we can just roll on through, kill this guy because he can resurrect the boss or something, I don't know, I've never kept him alive, and head on into the fool's idle boss fight. We kick things off by taking out some of the trash fodder before going for the boss herself. The area is littered with stunlock traps, so it pays to learn where those things are and avoid them if possible. As the fight progresses, she brings out more and more clones of herself and we're just getting shot from all directions. The real fool's idol fires much larger magic bullets though and doesn't have her own mini health bar when locked onto. So those are the two ways of finding out which one is real. She clocked in at about five and a half minutes, but it definitely felt like the most intimidating boss fight so far. The difficulty level is really starting to crank up now. We try getting to the first boss of World 5, the Valley of Defilement, and things start out well, but eventually we just get overwhelmed and destroyed. Yeah, we definitely need to come back here later, but where can we go? World 1 is blocked by dense fog, World 2 has the Flame Lurker, who's arguably the hardest boss in the game, World 3 has the Man Eaters, which again will just likely destroy us, and World 4 has the Ritual Path leading to the old hero, and World 5 is Gank City. After taking a bit of time away from the game to develop a battle plan, we decide to go for World 3. Not as far as the boss, but just far enough to drop the heart and therefore open the path to the boss for whenever we're ready. We take it slow because the enemies here are pretty manageable. Okay, spend an hour farming healing items and... Right, yeah, so the enemies here in World 3 are pretty manageable. Oh, for God's sake, man! One enemy that can cause a lot of aggravation is this Black Phantom Mind Flayer guarding these narrow stairs. I doubt we'll ever be able to beat it, and if we die, we've just lost a lot of progress. But don't worry, I have a plan. Alright, let's hope this works. Nice, okay, now run, 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 run. Wow, we actually made it. Oh. Okay, let's drop the second chain, and the heart has now fallen. Nice. The Manita bosses are now ready whenever we are. For now though, we head back to World 5 and somehow manage to make it to the boss door. Here's our setup going in. Alright, Leechmonger, here we go! Oh, I, I, I don't want to talk about it. Back to World 4 and, uh, right, so maybe this time if we... <laughs> My god, this is one heck of a challenge run. We're getting wrecked! There's only one thing for it. We need to grind some more. We use the Reaper strat to level up a fair bit more before heading back to World 5. The problem is that all of our deaths have turned the world tendency to black, meaning enemies are now significantly stronger and extra black phantom enemies are also spawning in. Heh, <laughs> lovely. 
Okay, Leech Monger for real this time. Okay, this is another boss that's weak to fire and is incredibly easy to kill from range. But it can offer a mild challenge up close, especially since the thing can heal itself. And regular viewers know exactly how I feel about bosses who can heal themselves. Stamina management is the name of the game here, and we have to kill it quickly before it starts regenerating. Fun fact, did you know the number of items in this arena is based on how many trash mob enemies fell to their deaths while you were exploring World 5-1? Yeah, that was new to me too. Pretty cool though. Uh, it's over in just two minutes. Job done. Back in World 2, we bait out these enemies and carefully drop down the mineshaft to skip straight to the second boss door. But brace yourself everyone, because many people say that this is the hardest boss in the entire game. Fingers crossed. Oh, let's do this. Flame Lurker is a terrifying, monkey-like opponent with strong AoE attacks, gap closes and very little downtime. His arena also contains dead ends and open pools of lava that can lead to a quick death if you're not constantly aware of your surroundings. These columns can help reduce his aggression, but his AI is mostly quite good, and in the remake they removed the various cheese strats from the original, so you do have to fight him properly without resorting to glitches. We've brought a lot of healing grasses with us, but waiting for openings to use them is tricky and always feels like a bit of a gamble. To make matters worse, we're only hitting for about 33 damage per strike, which is barely scratching the thing. This was an extremely long and challenging fight, but as always, I'll upload the full footage on a Patreon for those who are interested. Thank you again to all of these kind folks who are already actively supporting the channel. Really appreciate all of you. 17 minutes into the fight and he is low while we're at full health, so I just think sod it and we go all out. The camera isn't ideal here to say the least and we get knocked down a one shot territory, but manage to quickly chow down on a grass before his next blow lands. We create some distance to stabilise, but he messes up his jump and allows us to seal the deal. Flame Lurker on the first try, let's go. Almost immediately after is the third and final boss of this area, the Dragon God. Look, I'm going to speed up the footage here because if you've played this game before, you know exactly how this pans out. And if you haven't, well, it's basically just a stealth boss where you have to keep hiding behind pillars and clearing rubble until you can shoot two ballistas into him and land a few final blows once he's down. Surprisingly, it took just under five minutes because this boss is really straightforward once you get your head around it. The Tower Knight's thick fog door has now subsided, meaning we can continue with World 1. Nothing much to report here except that enemies are now much more numerous, have a lot more health and now include these powered up Red Eye Knights which offer a nice challenge but are relatively easily staggered. This fat official drops the key to the prison back near the Tower Knight to rescue Bior who automatically helps the player with the next boss and subsequent Blue Dragon mini boss, so in the spirit of making this run as challenging as possible, we choose not to free him. Instead, we clear the place and head on into our 1v1 against the Penetrator. Fun fact, I've never fought this guy without Bior, and I've never fought this guy with a melee build, so this should be interesting. Uh, I don't think I've ever realised just how aggressive this guy can be. He's constantly in your face and gives very little room to manoeuvre. When his sword glows orange, he can penetrate you and throw you around, which deals insane amounts of damage. After a while though, we start to get into a bit of a rhythm, a bit of a dance if you will, and the fight starts to feel like Mini Artorius. An incredibly challenging yet rewarding 11 minute fight. Look, if you've never tried this boss without BR, give it a go because it makes things a lot more interesting. More level ups and it's straight back to World 3-2 for the Maneater boss fight. We ahem, sneak past the Black Phantom Mind Flayer and take a second to mentally prepare ourselves for what is bound to be a painful experience. The wiki says that meleeing the Maneaters requires strategy, skill and patience and I couldn't agree more. We have to get as much damage in early because a second man eater will spawn after a certain time threshold has passed or whenever we get the first guy down to low HP, which is unlikely to happen. They spend the entire fight trying to bait us away from the central sconce in order to knock us off the edge, but this is by far the safest part of the arena. 
It's worth remembering that both Maneaters have powerful knockback abilities in addition to various magical attacks unless you cut off their tails. And I know what you're all thinking, why did we start attacking Manny in number 2 when it'd be much more sensible to finish off Manny in number 1 first? Well, it just came down to who was available. Being melee only in the fight means that you don't get a lot of options and these things spend a lot of time just flying around the place, so we just attack whoever pushes in. 15 minutes into the fight, I wish I was joking. The first one falls and the second one has got no tail. So it mostly kind of gets stuck in this weird loop of landing on the nearby broken column before going AFK for a while. <laughs> uh, are you okay there, buddy? Uh, gotta love the PS3 AI. Uh, soon enough, it's job done. A clean 17 minute fight. What is not clean or predictable, however, is the subsequent old monk boss. You see, while you're busy climbing the spiral tower full of hellish creatures, the game is searching for a real-life online player to act as your opponent. Now, I know they brought this back in the Dark Souls 3 DLC, but this was such a revolutionary game mechanic back in 2009 and something I'd love to see more games do. Sadly, this does mean that we're taking a low-level, unupgradable weapon with no armor or rings into a fight against a similarly leveled PvP fight against a player who probably takes this game way more seriously than I do. I'm actually surprised how well we did against uh, S underscore Aske underscore Uchiha, but he wiped us out with a katana in under four minutes. If you're out there and watching this, S underscore Aske underscore Uchiha, well, heh. <laughs> GG's, well played. On the second attempt, the game just manages to matchmake a player just as we're entering the boss door. This player, Archer Sterling M, looks even more intimidating, taking absolutely zero damage from our attacks and wielding a jagged curved sword as big as a person. This is 100% not winnable, so I sprint away and chicken out of the fight. Yeah, alright, I know, I know. Upon returning to the game, we do get dropped off at the bottom of the stairs, but the enemies are still dead. So if we can reach the boss door before the matchmaker finds someone to destroy us, then we'll be allowed to go up against the NPC version of the monk and actually have a fair shot. Come on. Yes, NPC monk, let's go. You can always tell the NPC version of the old monk because he uses claws, and honestly, who else in this game has ever used the claws? Being a humanoid enemy, we can keep him stunlocked, but it's always worth saving a bit of stamina to disengage after a combo. As his health bar lowers, he automatically gains floating magic ball thingies that periodically attack us, so timing our engagements becomes even more important. He wastes time punching a chair and rolling into a wall for some reason, so we sidestep his magical barrage and go in for the final combo. A hollow victory, but a victory nonetheless. That means worlds 2 and 3 are now fully complete. Nice! Back to 4-2 where we're able to deal with the skellies by baiting them off of this cliff and easily make a dash to the boss door. Nothing different about our setup and we're level 83 so in theory this should go well. As always the old hero is blind so it's recommended to use a thief's ring but here we do not have that luxury. Instead the way this works is that whenever we hit him the game tells him our position for about 20 seconds even if we hide or make no noise. Therefore the best strategy is to wait until he walks to one end of the corridor, get a few hits in and then create space while trying our best to dodge his next 4 or 5 attacks. There's plenty of time to heal up between his combos though, as he spends most of the battle just aimlessly walking around the arena. After 16 and a half minutes, we've put the guy out of his misery and push on to the subsequent Storm King boss fight. Our first objective here is to kill a dozen or so of these magical manta rays in order to spawn the king himself. We start by grabbing all of the items in the arena, including the Storm Ruler Sword, which is the intended melee strategy for this fight. But is there any way of hitting these guys with just the Reaper Scythe? They never come down to ground level and don't deal friendly fire damage to each other, so for now we'll just have to admit defeat while we go away and devise a plan. In the meantime, let's make some more progress through World 5, specifically 5-2 The Swamp of Sorrow. Oh boy does this place live up to its name. A massive, dark, poisonous bog that slows your movement speed, enemies everywhere including these jellyfish that body block the main path and keep stabbing you, Ah, it's just not a good time. 
Fighting against entire mobs is extremely challenging for us, so the best bet, especially against powerful enemies like these giant depraved ones guarding the second fog door, is to carefully bait them out one at a time and stay aware of our positioning so we're not accidentally walking into the poisonous swamp. The stage goes on forever, but we do eventually unlock the shortcut that shaves 80% of the level off. Ha! Congratulations indeed. Time for the Dirty Colossus boss fight, and given that this is the final world we need to clear out, I'd be very surprised if this guy puts up much of a challenge, but here we go. This thing has an arm cannon, powerful melee attacks that completely break your poise, AoE blasts, and can inflict damage over time for some reason, probably due to the insects. I know this boss fight gets a lot of hate online, but I quite like it. The demon really encapsulates the pestilence theming of World 5 and acts as a stark juxtaposition to the upcoming third boss of the area. We played aggressively here, so it was only a four minute fight. We just grab the demon's soul and push on into the third and final boss of the area. Now this boss is one of my favourites in the entire Soulsborne series, Maiden Astraya and her bodyguard Gal Vinland. The idea of trying to kill someone who's just trying their best to bring a bit of relief and healing to the world in order to harvest their soul for the greater good just doesn't sit right. It's an incredibly poignant fight and one that I don't think I'll ever forget. What makes this fight even better is the number of different ways that you can approach it. Either ignore Gal Vinland and just focus on killing Astraya, either with a bow or by rushing her through the plague ridden swamp, or face her bodyguard head on. Because if you do manage to defeat Gal Vinland and then talk to Astraya, she will commit. well, she will defeat herself. <laughs> Let's keep this YouTube friendly. Gal, however, is an absolute tank. He nullifies pretty much all damage with his shield, wields a giant hammer with insane damage, reach and knockback, and if we push far enough ahead, he will even bait us into fighting him in the plague-inflicting swamp closer to Astraya, which obviously we don't want to do. To make matters worse, Gal can even heal himself back to full HP, completely negating 4-5 or five minutes worth of work in lowering his HP. Ugh. We try to counteract this by pushing in whenever we see him casting anything, and with a bit of luck he's down in a whopping 12 minutes. All that's left is to claim our demon soul and get the hell out of there. Job done. You, you killed very well. Do as you like. That just leaves one boss that we haven't yet attempted, Old King Alant, an insanely agile and tanky boss who has the ability to de-level you, which is a scary mechanic that I haven't seen in any other RPG. We crack every soul in our possession to gain a boatload of levels, take on the Black Phantom versions of Penetrator, Phalanx and the Tower Knight, who honestly aren't that scary so long as we deal with them one at a time, bait out and deal with more Red Eye Knights, sprint past the Blue Dragon since we have no way of defeating it, crank open the shortcut that was added in the remake, thank god, sprint past the Blue Dragon again who's even more scary without Bior here to keep his aggro, cheese the Black Phantom Prince of Strava, ha <laughs> ha bye bye, and take the insanely long lift to face the False King himself. Two thousand years later. Here's our setup going in. We have a lot of healing items, but we're only level 92, which I'm worried might be a bit too low given that we have no armor, no rings, or even a decent weapon. But let's see how things pan out. As always, Alant is keen to close the distance and deal damage as rapidly as possible. On this attempt, we try to stay close to him and wait for windows of opportunity, of which there are very few. He's just so fast and our blocks are mitigating almost nothing. He tries to de-level us with his blue grab a few times, but rolling away is enough to avoid it. We do get hit by his massive AoE blast, which takes about half of our health off, but we pick ourselves up and keep trying. The fight seems completely unwinnable, but that's when we notice something interesting. After Alant uses his gap closer, he just kind of stands there and accepts whatever we can dish out for a few seconds. We can even keep him briefly stunlocked during this period until we run out of stamina, which is four hits. 
We might have noticed this too late though, because a lamp goes completely ballistic and slashes us into the ground. Ouch! Second attempt, and we've come back a few levels higher. Aland kicks things off with his gap closer, allowing us to get a single strike in for a whopping 37 damage. <laughs> Our strategy this time around is to bait his gap closer as much as possible, only striking whenever he's open after the attack. His big AoEs allow us to either create distance and heal up, or do a single free strike to cancel his animation. So those two moves are the ones we want to see the most, especially when used in conjunction with each other. His AI does get glitchy around this pile of rubble sometimes, leading to a degree of unpredictability, but it's nothing we can't work around. As he gets low, he starts to just fly right over the rubble and really gets in our face, but we stick with the routine, so he's down in just 15 minutes. Contrary to popular belief though, we can't yet finish the game, as all bosses need to be beaten before the Maiden in Black will take us to the old one. And yep, the Storm King at the Altar of Storms still hasn't been beaten. Interestingly enough though, this happened. Yeah, we somehow managed to just land a single heavy attack on one of the low flying manta rays as it passed over a tiny bump in the ground. The problem is that the odds of this happening are incredibly slim. Trust me, I was here for over an hour and didn't manage to hit any other manta rays anywhere on the map. But even if we did manage to take out the regular enemies, the boss itself flies much higher up and would be literally impossible to reach. The only solutions are to either use damaging items like throwing knives, or as seen here, use the intended method which is the storm ruler to take the thing down. I'll let you guys decide whether you think this is a run fail or not, eh, I had great fun with this game either way. All that's left is to head down to the old one, defeat the real King Alant who's just a ball of sludge that barely moves, stomp on this nice lady's head and watch the credits roll. Can you beat Demon Souls with only the crappy pre-order exclusive scythe? Haha, <laughs> well yes you can. Ah, uh, well, kind of. That felt like a really quick run, clocking in at only about 13 and a half hours, which is actually pretty decent. As always, let me know what game you want to see a challenge run of next. I'm not releasing a video every month anymore because despite all the sponsorship offers I've been getting, I want to keep this channel as just a hobby and something I enjoy doing rather than it becoming a second job, if that makes sense. Anyway, I'll be making videos for everyone, but I'm not going to stress about deadlines or anything. Look, they're ready when they're ready. Uh, I think this is a much healthier approach and it'll mean that I don't get burned out on YouTube. As always, thank you all so much for the nice comments and words of encouragement. Ah, oh, you guys are great. Alright, see you later everyone. Cheers.